Hello and welcome to Quality Policing. I'm Peter Moskos. And I'm Nick Selby. Whoa, it's like a blast from the past. <laughs> Long time listeners, um, you may recognize Nick Selby uh, because um, this podcast was actually his idea and we did the thir- first like 32 episodes together. Um, then Nick, uh, then we had a falling out over, I think, uh, was it, um, was a pursuit policy or something? No, no I um, that I got a job and they didn't let me talk to you anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, Nick got a job in the NYPD and, uh, had to stop his podcast contribution. Um, but he just gave me a call and, uh, said, I uh, want to talk about something. Can I be on the podcast? I was like, uh, yeah. How about right now? <laughs> How about now? So, um, uh, Nick, why, why, what, what do you want to talk about? So when I was, when I was at the NYPD, um, the, uh, the main project that I got involved with was trying to understand how cybercrime affected people. And it was, it was kind of interesting because this is, you know, the NYPD is the agency that counts everything. And yet they weren't counting cybercrime. They did a great job with identity theft. Uh, really, I mean, really good. And, and, they, they, they came up with these policies over a few years because it's really difficult to, to get new stuff into the system, but they, they figured it out. Um, and that, that's actually a podcast in and of itself, just how OMAP can make a new policy and figure out every possible way that it can be screwed up at every stage. You uh, know, from acronym control. alert, um, OMAP, what's OMAP? Uh, OMAP is the Office of Management and Planning, I think. And they're, they're the ones who actually figure out the process. Like, how do you, okay, you know, we want the cops to do something. How? They, they got to put it in the patrol guide. They have to do training. They have to do all these things. And this is the logistics are astounding at the at the the scale that NYPD has to has to deal with. So um, I'll say NYPD has the benefit that they have something like OMAP. But yeah. I mean, my God, it's a bureaucratic uh, organization with um, 35,000 cops. And I don't know how many more civilian employees. I, it's I think a, it's like the amount of a it's the classic you know tanker then sometimes it gets stuck in the Suez canal <laughs> um, that's exactly it's a right. big organization um look i'll say this by city standards um it has a lot more um efficiency and accountability than other city agencies but that's a low bar <laughs> i mean but it does it really does and they're and they're very good at moving huge things at scale uh and you know you it's a good analogy you know just like a tanker i mean it it can't turn on a dime but once it starts that turn, look out because, you know, they're turning and they're going and there's no there's no way back. So uh, a friend of mine who probably would like to be named, but I won't name him, uh, described the NYPD as what's the big dinosaur in Jurassic Park? And he T-Rex? said, I probably. And it, it, he said, it takes a while for the NYPD to notice you. And it might <laughs> turn and it might twist. And finally, but he's like, once that motherfucker starts chasing you, they're going to get you. Yeah, yeah. Objects and mirror are closer than they appear. <laughs> That's yeah. absolutely true. So um, when you know when I first got there, the the thing that I that I saw, and I was talking to Commissioner O'Neill and and uh, Commissioner Miller uh, in the in the giant conference conference room, um, and I was like, we don't know. Uh, we we know that there's scams. We know that the people are getting calls, but we don't know what the most popular scams are. And we don't know the demography. Like, is this just little old ladies in Queens or is this, is this, you know, across the board, we have, we don't, we, we have no way of knowing. And we also don't know how much uh, money is lost. We, we think it's a lot because when we hear about it, you know, and I think the, the most incredible thing is that everybody I talked to had a relative you know, usually a mom or dad who had been taken for usually five to $15,000 by these call scammers. And we, we kind of were in this netherworld and, and we are, I mean, law enforcement in America is still in this netherworld where it's like, well, you know, it's not really identity theft. I think I read something. I think you got to call the FBI. And when you, you know, you call the FBI and they're like, oh yeah, go to the IC3 website and fill in a form. And I, I was talking and, and O'Neill was like, you know, that's really stupid. <laughs> we, we should probably fix that. And, and so I got this is kind of former got, NYPD yeah. commissioner O'Neill. And um, he, I had kind of had the blessing above and, and commissioner Miller was also very interested in this uh, chief Galati and in, in the intelligence. John Bureau. Miller. Sorry. 
I'm just you're saying oh, you're just narrating people, aren't know, people aren't going to know who they are. I don't yeah. know Miller's, what's Miller's title. Or Miller's was, the, was the deputy commissioner for uh, intelligence no. and counterterrorism, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, Chief Galati is the, the, the chief of intelligence, uh, Chief Hart's the executive officer. And they, they were all like, okay, you know, it's harmless enough. And they didn't know what to do with me anyway. So they were like, okay, you know, t- take a look at it. And it took a long, a long, long time because I found out since we're not counting it, um, finding out how big the problem was, was an adventure, like a, just a deep dive into the bowels of the, of the record system, which as you know, is just gigantic. Um, and we, we finally figured out ways of searching for how many people were reporting. And, and then o- over months and months and months, we got to the point where we had enough information, we figured out the size of the problem and we, we made an estimation that it was $250 million a year. In New, in York, New, York, City. In New York City. Yeah. And to put this into perspective, um, that year, uh, or this was this is the previous year, like 2018, uh, car theft was about 52 million. And, you know, 250 is more. Um, <laughs> there's also, there's it. something about these crimes that is worse than the monetary mm-hmm. loss. Um, you know, and cars are covered by insurance and, you know, but also because these crimes are <clears throat> designed to take advantage of vulnerable people. Yes. Um, and sometimes it's people who, you know, have dementia. I mean, sometimes they're really vulnerable. Other times, um, you know, my mom got a call uh, from someone who knew his grandson's name um, and she didn't fall for it, but she like, f- she was going along for a bitch. Why would, you know? They, yeah. You know, she, yeah. They knew and, her, and her grandson. Um, we were mentioning that, like, well, they didn't know that, our shit. They said they did. Well, they, they said that they knew. And and here's the thing: like, one of the most common scams when they do when they do get an elderly person on the phone, or when they figure out that it's an elderly person, sometimes they're just calling around and they they listen for the sound of an elderly person, which is, you know, it's you can do it. And what they'll do is they'll they'll pretend that they've been in an accident, and they're like, "Grandma, grandma," and and then the grandma Nick, is that you? That's exactly what happens. Yes. Uh, I can't talk. I was in an accident. Here's my lawyer. I'm under arrest. And now they put the scam guy on the phone and, and he's like, I'm Eddie's lawyer. <laughs> and, and so it feels like they know who Eddie is. And a lot of times they don't really know who Eddie is. These things are, are, are much more opportunistic and random than, than targeted. Uh, it's a really interesting point that, that you make, but a lot. So the, the most common scams, as it turns out, I mean, we find out later six and 10 are these calls. Um, but what, where, where we are in, in the United States, and this is what I'm trying to come back. What do you mean? And, and so, what you said still, six and 10, what do you mean? Six and 10 of the frauds that ah. get reported is these kinds of that, that involve cyber. And I, when I say involve cyber, I mean, maybe they get a text message, maybe they get an email, maybe it's a pop-up on their phone telling them that they have malware. Maybe it's a website. Uh, often it's a phone call, but it, when, when you put the, all these different categories. The, the lifetime sorry? that the extended warranty in my car thing, does that fall under cybercrime? It, well, uh, I'll get there. Yeah, because okay. it, it kind of does. Um, but I sometimes like playing along there, with them before telling them, but, but I don't understand because... I don't have a car. I don't have a car. That always <laughs> yes. And th- this is the real problem. There's no definition in American law enforcement of what cybercrime is. And even worse, there's no understanding of what the word cyber means. Everybody uses this word cyber, and it's this huge slush fund of all these different things. And, and this, I, I was referring to it as a Rorschach test, because I say to you, like, we're having a conversation. I say, well, I'm in the cyber thing. And you're like, oh, yeah, cyber. I could be talking about network intrusion, and you could think of, think I'm talking about SIM swapping phone calls. or yeah. phone calls, right? I would not consider phone cyber calls cyber. Been. Yeah. So- so what we had to do was make a definition and, and, and the Europeans are a few years ahead of us in this and, and they have already broken this out into what they call cyber native crime. Now that's, that's like, you know, the fat guy in the basement hacking into computers that President Trump was talking about, right? It's, it's crimes that couldn't exist without the internet. It's I hack into your computer and I go in uh, or I go into your Bitcoin wallet and I transfer money out of your Bitcoin wallet into my Bitcoin wallet cyber native right that and we can refer to it as that but it's like you know it i'm sure everyone be. remembers that movie war yeah. games from 35 years ago yeah well anybody who's alive um and then there's other crimes which are just crime 
they're just basic crimes, but they they have some kind of a, of a component that involves, uh, usually it's communication tools like a phone or email or, or SMS. Um, sometimes it's messing around with your cell phone. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about SIM swap, which is, is a pretty, it's a pretty devastating crime. Uh, it's, it's, it's on the way down, but the, those who get hit are, it's, it's more devastating than ever. A, a, but I'll, I'll, I'll describe it in a sec, but, but these are what we call cyber enabled crimes. So it's a, it's a traditional crime, like a fraud, extortion, grand larceny, but we were getting wrapped around the axle as law enforcement because it had this component that made all the detectives run into brick walls because it's like, whoa, wait, wait a minute. It's a, they did what? They, they got you on a cell phone and then they told you to text something and, and then you had to go put Bitcoin in an ATM. You better call somebody else because, you know, this is already sounding too hard for me. And I don't think it is that hard. It's just that we've never trained anybody. We never talked about it. We've never trained anybody to how to do it. And so that's hard. If you don't know what, if you don't have a protocol and we don't, and, and I don't mean the NYPD, I mean like anybody, then you can't follow it. Um, SimSwap is the one. So like you're sitting home at a Friday night and maybe your phone stops working and you look at it, you're like, huh, that's weird. Maybe you don't even notice, right? But you look down at your phone and it just, it's, it's got no service. So maybe you just think, oh, weird. So you restart your phone and then it still doesn't work. So maybe you go outside to see if you can get better coverage and it still doesn't work. And after a while, it dawns on you that your cell phone is not connected to the cellular network anymore. And what has happened is some criminal has called AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile and they've said, Hey, I'm Bob. And, and I got, you know, they're, they're impersonating you. They know your phone number. So they've already done a little bit of research. They got your phone number and now they've got your email. Cause you know, uh, I'm just taking a guess that Peter Moss goes to gmail.com would be an address that you might have. I don't know. I don't and, ironically, okay. ha. a lot of people, but do. I could, they'll, but I they'll could figure it out. Right. Yeah. And, and anyway, then, you can email my, you can find my, yeah, my email. Right, we can find your email. Private. It's pretty easy. Yeah. So if I know your phone number, I know your email, I can call up a cell phone company. I can, I, by the way, if I know your phone number, I can type it into a computer and for free, I can find out who your carrier is. So now I call your carrier and I'm like, Hey, this is Peter. I just got this new iPhone 12 and it's really great. Except, Oh no, my old SIM card from my old phone, which was a rotary. It doesn't fit in the new one. So I need to, how can I do this? I, I got a new SIM card at Walgreens, but now they tell me that I, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Three times out of four, the customer service representatives say, okay, what's the password on your account? And then they just hang up and call back till they get another one time out of four. They'll be like, oh, okay, what's the new SIM card number? And you tell them the new SIM card number. Now they associate the bad guy's SIM card with your phone. And all of a sudden your phone stops working because they've got your phone. Mm. As soon as that happens, they go to your email. They say, I forgot my password. And your email sends a text message where to your cell phone, which is now their cell phone. Now they've got a text message. They log into your email with that, reset your password. Now you're locked out of your own email. Now they've got your mobile phone and your email. So the first thing they do is they start looking through your email for anything that says Chase Bank, HSBC, Fidelity, Vanguard, and they find all your accounts. Now, how do those accounts get reset? Well, Same through a text here. message and an email. So are you saying that two-step verification, um, which for other reasons we don't have to get into, I don't yeah. use two-step verification is actually a security flaw. It's well, two-step verification using your cell phone which, SMS that's how it is usually... a big flaw. Yeah. So what you want to do is something called time-based one-time password, which is like Google Authenticator or Authy or Duo, something like that, where it's a it's a program actually running on your smartphone that gives you that one-time password every every 30 seconds, every 60 seconds. That can't be gamed like this. But a lot of people still use that SMS. We have seen people get their entire life savings drained in a matter of minutes. And I've also seen that the victims, when they lose their email, it can take months to get it back because you have to prove that you're you, but you have no way of doing it because you don't have your phone, you don't have your past, they've changed all those things. You're you're locked out and you're in a world of hurt. So that's a that would be, you know, a that would be a cyber enabled crime because what they're doing is human social engineering to, to trick people into changing it, or they're going into a store with fake ID saying that they're you. So there's a human- component. Well, or the store is in on it. Or the store is in on it. And actually, as part of our pilot, we actually arrested some Confederates who were working in cell phone stores who were actually doing that, that the bad guys would come in, they paid them off. Um, so- So you came in like the Union Army? 
Uh, well, no, uh, they oh. sent you know detectives to go in again. Oh, I just <laughs> uh, just the Confederate part. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Damn Rebs. We set up the we set up this thing, and the the purpose of this uh, pilot was to figure out how big the problem was. And we weren't we weren't trying to like make any arrests or do it. It was just how big is the problem? How much money is lost? Just so that we can start the conversation. And the pilot went on for several months, eleven months study, and four months of actual work in Queens South. And we found that the actual number was um, about three hundred and twenty million dollars. Uh, a year in New York City alone, just the five boroughs of New York City, $320 million, about 20,000 of these crimes happening in New York City. And is there, um, did you estimate what the average hit is worth? $14,000. So 14,000, 14 grand will, you know, there's no expense to failure. There's a time expense and a labor expense, Yeah. but it doesn't matter how many times you fail if you eventually succeed. Yes. One of the, um, the, the, the intel guys at the district attorney of New York, he said, the guys who were doing uh, crack in the 80s, selling crack in the 80s and selling untaxed cigarettes in the 90s, they're doing this now. And the gangs are doing this now. So some of the surprising things that we learned- Which and, I just want to interject. Um, oh yeah. Is one contributing factor probably to the violence decline in New York? Is well, that yeah, a lot of those same guys. And we did uh, M Martin Costi from NPR did a story about this. He came around with us for, for a couple of days and, and uh, did a story about this. And, and my, his favorite quote, at least, was I said, you know, people think that this is people in Nigeria. This is knuckleheads in the Bronx. This is not like uh, one of the prosecutors in Queens said, don't tell me they're in Jamaica. They're in Jamaica, Queens. Like they're these are locals. And, and it, as it turns out, actually, the majority of these these actors are local or regional or at least national. And if they're not, there's there are a number of scams where they are controlled by overseas. And we've all probably heard the, the overseas tech support calls. Um, and those guys, the actors are overseas, but their money's in America. Their money is in the region. And because they need this, just like anything else, it's a business and they have to have mules and mule herders. They have to have coordinators. They have to do money laundering and get the money collected and then send it out. So you can put your hands on something. And this was a big shock. This was something that, that really surprised us. Another thing that surprised us was the demographics of this. Um, so we all think that this is an elderly problem. The median age was 42 hmm. of the victims who reported. And there were, I mean, an awful lot of digital natives getting caught up in this. Uh, one of the things when, when Martin was doing the radio program, um, we, the first victim of the day was a 22 year old in Brooklyn in the projects. And he had sold his phone on eBay and the guy who bought his phone looked in the phone and found videos, you know, sexy videos of him with his girlfriend and extorted him. And after the girlfriend broke up with him, he called the police. And, you know, we, we basically said, look, you know, we can work on it. And, and because it had been, I think he waited a week or something like that. The, the sooner you get in touch with the police, the more chance they have to track it down. But it was, there were a lot of young people who were getting hit by these things. And that presumably, is that just, whichever detective picks up the phone in the precinct or is that a specialized detective to deal with these tech issues so that's a that's a really great question and that was that was part thank of thank you the problem. <laughs> well because it was one of the questions that we didn't anticipate having to think about and, and as it turns out what law enforcement does because it's cyber and cops have 10 thumbs and they don't like cyber they, who do we have who knows about cyber? And it's always the ICAC guy. It's always the guy doing child pornography. And there's one of them. So there's like one guy in the police department who knows forensics. So now suddenly the forensics guy, who's often a civilian, but you know, in, in NYPD, there's a lot of sworn uh, guys who do forensics, but they're not frontline investigators supposed to be doing everything, but everything gets thrown on their desk and they don't have, they just don't have the time. And it's also not appropriate. Most of the time, like that eBay thing, any detective who knew could be like, oh, okay, well, you know, who bought it on eBay? Let's get a warrant and serve it to eBay and find out who bought the phone and where it was sent. Now we've got a name and an address and it's pretty damn simple, right? You don't have to do a lot of rocket science, pocket protector, super secret squirrel stuff. It's just basic police work. Uh, when we solved SIM, uh, SIM swaps, when the NYPD- and I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe people don't know that, but it's pretty routine for police departments to get to see, you get warrants and serve them to yeah. the to the phone company or whatever, um, but that's a pretty common routine practice. I'm, yeah. I'm sure they have someone on their end who just deals with that. 
Um, I'll tell you that one of the one of the sim swaps that we did um, was, and, and it was this guy. He, he was on the Grand Larceny, uh, the Grand Larceny squad in the in the DA's office, and he's a really good cyber guy. But when we talked to the victim, he called up AT and T, got a customer service representative, got the got the victim to say, "Yes, you can talk to this guy." And he's like, "Hey, there was a SIM card put into that phone. Can you tell me the number of that SIM card?" And the AT and T guy's like, "Sure." He gives him the number. He said, "Okay." Were there any other phone numbers that or phone accounts that had that same SIM card attached to it in the last year? And the guy's like, uh, oh yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. So can you please tell me all of those accounts? We had a list of, of victims right there. As a matter of fact, it took that detective um, longer to get the clearance to go to Columbus, Ohio and lock this guy up than it did to figure out who he was. And, and when they, <laughs> this was great. And talk about like not having to have special skills. They got Columbus SWAT. And they went to this guy's house to serve the search warrant and get all of his devices because they knew who he was. They kick open the door and there he is. He's on his phone, holding it up on his computer when they walk in the door. (laughs) So John is like, John, he's like, okay, so what's the password to your phone? Guy's like, well, I'm not telling you that. So John's like, oh, okay. He looks at the girlfriend. He goes, what's the password to his phone? She's like, 98731. (laughs) Like types it in. All of the evidence is on his phone. Now that guy ended up getting arrested and getting charged and convicted. And that none of that had to do with having a computer science degree. It's just basic police work. Let me ask a not good, probably a not good question. How do the cops call the victims and convince them they're cops if they've already been victimized in this manner before? (laughs) So, um, (laughs) <laughs> Good question. So the, the initial victim usually reports. There's a lot of reasons, by the way, we found out a lot of reasons why people don't report, starting with I'm too stupid to live. Uh, like, oh my God, I'm just so embarrassed. I can't believe I fell for that once they figured it out. Um, there, there's some, what the fuck are the cops going to do? Like, why would I call the police? Because they're not going to do anything. And that's often not wrong. Um I maybe actually do have an arrest warrant out for me. Like you know, maybe that's <laughs> I'm not really wanting to call the police. There's there's a few of these reasons why they don't call, but if, but if they call and if they report and they don't get laughed at, you know, and they and they manage to get a report done, then it's really a question of um and 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 my, my the guy I was working with, he was a he was a an officer that I got. So you know, I was a civilian at NYPD, he was an officer who we would go together to the victims that we identified and we would walk in and, and, you know, so now it's a guy in uniform, another guy, and, and we're talking to them. We have all their information. So it's pretty easy to, to, to convince them at that point. Okay. Um, but that, and that's not a bad question. Like all this stuff is brand new, right? We haven't done it before. We made an app that helped. The- but let me, are the victims if in New York city, are they generally in New York city? I mean, why, 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 I assume they'd be scattered all over America, but no. No, the, the, well, we were the NYPD. So we were only going to victims who called in to the NYPD or showed up at a oh, place. Okay. But I'm saying when you got that list of, of dozens of other yes. uh, victims, how did you, how did you deal with that? Three of them were in New York city. So that gave, that gave the NYPD and the district attorney of New York, the jurisdiction to, to, they, they could investigate that. Um, the rest of them were outside of New York City. And then I believe Danny, the district attorney of New York, did referrals to all the other agencies and come and say, hey, we arrest guy. Now, the money was gone by that point. It was 10 days, half a million dollars that kid took, and he had just spent all the money. So that, you know, wasn't, uh, they, they didn't get restitution, but they did get some justice because the, the guys, had, um, we made an app for the patrol guys to be able to ask the right questions. And this was the biggest barrier that we had um, to, to getting this approved. There were a lot of people in the NYPD, not, not at the chief level, but at the sort of lieutenant level, who were like, no cop's going to give a crap. You, you can't get cops. They don't care. They're not going to do this. They're too lazy. They're, you know, they, they said all these terrible things. We went around, and, and Louie and I, the, the, the guy I told you about, we trained more than 700 IPD officers. We would go to the roster. We would go to the, go to the roll call in the morning and the afternoon and the evening. I'll tell you that these cops were frustrated by these, and they were pissed off at these things. And they, when we told them, you know, we were able to say, hey, in your precinct last year, $1.4 million was taken from your, the people who live here in your precinct. And they were pissed. And they all heard about it before, but they never knew what to do. And as soon as they heard that there was something that they can do, they were on it. And all of them wanted to do something. And when we gave them this app that I'm just about to tell you about, they all wanted to do something about that too. And they used the app. So we had, you know, 
the, 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 every one of the people we gave the app to used it at least once to try it out. But then many of them, not, not only the thing it was most, but many of them used it on calls that they were on um, to actually do. And we have all the user statistics, which showed that they were using the thing. So you give the cops a chance to do something. I don't care what your politics are. People don't become cops because they don't care. They don't become cops uh, because of the money. They want to help. And so if you give them the ability to help, they will help. We made an app that just gave them they had to answer four questions. What happened, you know, what kind of crime was this? How much money was taken? Um, how were they told to send the money and hit go? And then they get the questions to ask. They wrote those questions down. Those went to the detectives. And that was how we did it. Um, the reason that I'm talking to you now is a lot of other agencies heard that story on NPR about a year ago. And I'll, um, I'm getting phone send, send me the link when you can and I'll put it up on the uh, oh, yeah. qualitypolicing.com website. I definitely will. Um, and so a lot of agencies and also the, the National Sheriff's Association, they are saying, we need to do something because just telling people to call the FBI and fill in a questionnaire is not getting us anywhere. We, you know, we, these are crimes and we have to do something. Um, so when they do that, the first thing that I tell them is, oh yeah, that app you heard about on the radio, I'll give it to you free. And it's open source. You can, it's open source for law enforcement and for government. You can use it and you can customize it. I'll show you how to customize it. And if you can't customize it, I can introduce you to people in the open source community who will help you customize it because it's really easy. Uh, you don't have to do any CGIS stuff. It's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't plug into your, to your system. So it doesn't have to meet federal standards of data security and all these other things because you're not putting any information in. You're just getting information out of it. And I'm handing that out. So it, we've had agencies from Ireland and in several different places around the United States ask for app, and I'm perfectly happy to, to make it available to government and help them figure out how to use it. And also to share the full report that I made for the NYPD before I left about exactly what we found in our study. Cause the study was really surprising to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, how I can put it up on the website or how do you want, to, uh, if, Law enforcement is interested. How how should they um, take you up on this offer? Oh, that would be great. Yeah, if you can put it, if you can put that up on the website, and you know, you can put like a link, use your mail link, and uh, have them, you know, just forward them on to me, and I'll be perfectly happy to to talk them through. Um, oh, I'm not forwarding. This is not anything. like something I'm doing for money. It has to be a direct way to contact you. Um, yeah. Uh, is yeah. So this will be. Uh, I think it'll be episode um, forty one on qualitypolicing.com. That'll be awesome. Yeah. And it's just, just to, so people know, this isn't like a consulting gig. This isn't something I'm doing for money. There's a, you know, there's a few of us around who are just willing to, to volunteer um, to help people get it because I don't care. I, I don't care how you do it. If I give you the stuff and you figure out a better way to do it, that's great. Please let me know and tell other people. Um, but this is something as a public service, I think we all need to do because it's really hard. It's really hard to get our brains wrapped around this. And I'll tell you one last thing, like cops, cops, patrol officers, especially don't like not knowing what to do. It's their job to know what to do. You show up on scene and you're the guy right? Everybody's looking at you to tell them how to behave and what to do. And cops, you know, they're good at that. You know, you stand over there, you stand over there, you do this. And I got to fill out this form. You turn around. Um, when they don't know how to do that, they get really quiet. <laughs> and then they just, they just feel really uncomfortable because it's, it's just out of their, um, uh, it's out of their comfort zone. And uh, I, I like to say that no cop in the history of cops ever got in trouble for doing nothing. And because, you know, it's a tactic I'm sure you've used yourself. If you're not sure what to do, wait a couple of days, <laughs> and, you know, something will happen and usually they'll just go away. Um, this is a way to solve that problem because you give them even just a little bit of guidance and they'll take it from there. The, the, the strategy here is you get the patrol officers because they're the first ones to get these calls, right? The patrol officers have to understand this and not be afraid of it and not think that it's something too complicated for them or for someone else. You know, hey, it's a crime victim. If, if somebody said that they got hit over the head with a pipe and they took their wallet, you'd be running to help them. If somebody takes $14,000 from one of your residents and you're like, uh, that's not a good, that's not good policing. That's not good police service. So Take the notes, take good notes. You don't have to be a scientist. Just write down what they're saying. And, and you know, if they say that they had to put in Bitcoin, 
get the receipt. If they, if they, they use the Bitcoin ATM, get that receipt. That's got all the information that a detective needs. If they say that they got tech, that they had to text a gift card to somebody, get the phone number they texted it to. What kind of gift card? Was it an Apple Home Depot? Write it down because now you can start figuring out what the bad guys are using and getting intelligence. If the patrol officers do that, they give it to the, to the detectives. Now it's not a piece of shit from the moment it hits the detective's desk and they have the ability to start some investigation. Even if they're not that great at it, they have a starting point. And you know, you give a good detective a starting point and they'll usually figure it out. So it's, it's really all about basic police work and it's about um, just working the case that's in front of you. And you know, there's some other problems upstream like the DAs don't wanna take the cases because they are elected and they don't understand it either. That's tomorrow's problem. Let's figure out how to get the cases in the system, start to count it. Because I'm telling you, when we see these numbers from the FBI about uh, cybercrime, those are very, very underreported. FBI says it themselves. Those are very underreported. This is a huge problem in this country. And the only way to fix it is to actually fix it. I should also mention just for the hell of it that um, in case anyone is like, who is this civilian telling us what to do that? Uh, before you worked for the NYPD, you were a sworn officer and a detective um, working in these. Yeah. Uh, so you, you have that experience Ten as years, well. actually. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I'm and this is the thing. Like down down in Texas, where I was working, um, we would get a lot of cases. Uh, you know, sometimes it was ransomware, and those. You know, yeah, that that does go to the FBI. They have got really good people at the FBI. They have really really good investigators for like cyber native crime. That's true. But oftentimes we would get these kinds of scams, and we would go and just do exactly what I'm saying, which is you know I didn't just like make this up when I got to NYPD. We had a lot of experience, and my agency. I think we were one of the first, and we were like a hundred hundred man agency. But we were one of the first people to give identity theft recovery tips to people. We had a whole list of things that you could do uh, if you were a victim of identity theft, if you were a victim of cybercrime, like how you could figure out what happened and try to get some help. And that was actually one of the first things that, that got me talking to NYPD was that, that we were doing this in this tiny little town in Texas. I mean, I'm from originally from New York, so it was kind of a nice fit, but uh, that, that was how it started. Um. Thanks. Uh, this has been really informative. Um, well, thank you very much. And get two-factor authentication on your email. <laughs> it's really important. It I just, really well, is. no, it wasn't that. It was that the whole text thing. I was like, what if I lose my phone? Yeah, I, I never, I never have trusted my phone as, I don't trust my phone for anything, but I've certainly never trusted yeah. it as a security device. Um, pe people get robbed of phones. Um, I've it's always, yes, yeah, true. Is absurd. And, you know, well, that's, and that, you know, I did a, an article a couple of years ago for USA Today about how your phone was actually never intended to be a security device. And SMS is an inherently insecure protocol. It's just not done. It, we're using it. You know, it's kind of like the social security number. That's it what was, I was never intended say. to be an identification number. Yeah. You know, it, it, I remember we're old enough that we remember our social security card actually used to say right on it, not for identity, for, you know, for identification purposes. And, and now suddenly we're using that and, and look how well that's worked. And, and SMS uh, authentication, it's a really flawed system. And, uh, you know, I, if, I'm, if I'm working with an online bank or something like that, I, I take my money someplace else. I just don't do it if they won't support real authentication because it's just too easy to break in and take your money. Hmm. Well, on that note, that's why I keep mine in my mattress. Oh, wait. <laughs> but don't worry, I put a blockchain on it. Fine. <laughs> Anything else? Or, uh, like, uh, no, I mean, I just came on to blather that stuff. And, and, yeah, that, that's you know, great. And say hi. Nick, you can come back anytime <laughs> you've earned that by, um, by, by starting this podcast with me. Um, so this, I'm with Nick Selby, S-E-L-B-Y. Um, there'll be some information up at qualitypolicing.com related to uh, this information. And um, I am Peter Moskos. And um, it's good to have you back, Nick. And thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks a lot. That's really disconcerting. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Jesus. You can't start with that's really disconcerting. <laughs> now I gotta wait. Ooh.